Well, thank you for joining today on our Side by Side. And we're going to be thinking about that subject of money or material things. It's pretty hard to get away from it, isn't it, in our lives? It's everywhere. I mean, even in this pandemic, it's interesting to see how people have been evaluating the pandemic according to the amount of money it costs or how people will lose their businesses. And and these are certainly really hard things. I understand that. But there's also a sense in which at times maybe I feel that the loss of money is more more of a crisis to some than the loss of the lives that have been lost and all the other things that go with that, which makes you sit down and think about what are the real values and, and how do we put a value onto anything? In what do we place our security? Where do we find our peace? Or what is our basis of acceptance or inclusion or status? All of these things flow around the idea of money and material things. What Jesus does is he changes our hearts so that we recover the true sense of value. I mean, Matthew 6 comes to mind when you think of how Jesus there puts it. And here, reading from the New Living Translation, he says, Why do you worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothes, and yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today, and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what what will we eat, or what will we drink, or, or what will we wear? No, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Heavenly Father already knows what you need. So, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. That is the reorientation there in those verses of our hearts by trusting in the Lord. And and we can see the effect that this had on his own disciples and on the early disciples of the early church, how they gladly gave, shared or sold to provide as they discovered the needs of others around them. And they they had found this true value that Jesus is talking about. So Proverbs This wisdom that we get here confirms and affirms or is confirmed and affirmed in the life of Jesus and his ministry. It tells us that wealth deludes and makes us feel much, much more confident and wise than we really should. For example, Proverbs 18, 23 and 24, there's a little picture there. It says, the poor use entreaties, but the rich answer roughly. You see how wealth of the rich makes them overconfident? They answer roughly. They don't believe they they need to live by the same standards or to address people in the same way. It's so powerful just how wealth can affect all of us. Like Take, for example, Proverbs 18, 11. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. Isn't that kind of the idea that this man's wealth gives him a sense of security that is Well, it's like a strong city. It's not a strong city. You and I know that a very small little wind can blow it down. Some circumstance. He becomes unwell. What value is all his wealth once he's sick? He cannot pay for one day of health. One minute of health, he cannot pay for it, really, when you think about it. And so Proverbs leads us to think in a different way about life. And that, of course, is the way Jesus does. He comes to get us to think differently about life, to think about life from a gospel-hearted way. And take, for example, his words there, Proverbs 16, 16, the words of Scripture, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Amazing, simple truth. It puts gold and silver as the two sort of key pieces of value in in Proverbs, these things, into their place. And it says, look, they're not really that important. You'd be much better to get wisdom and understanding. And so the very heart of all of this comes back to Proverbs 3, 9, I think, which says, honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And the key words I think there are honour the Lord. So it doesn't really matter what it is we're doing. 
What it is we have, be it much or be it little, it's the question is, am I using what I have in a way that gives honour to the Lord? Or to put it another way, that would make others speak well of God, that paints God as, as, the, as who he really is, so that we're, we're not fretful and we're not hoarding because we honour God, we, we trust him. We're able to give, even whenever we don't have that much, we can still give because we honour the Lord, we trust him, we believe that he is true to his word and that he will meet the needs of his children. How many opportunities and dangers there are in the power of the desire for wealth? Because I, I think we need to understand that underneath all of this is something else. The gospel teaches us that the issue is not money. Money is just money. Things are just things. But it's the desire in our hearts. That's why it says that it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Not money. It's what's going on in our hearts that's the real issue. And these things can be a very good litmus test of what our hearts are really like. And if we discover this tension, this anxiety, this fear arising over, for example, the things we own, that reveals to us that our hearts and our desires need to be addressed in regard to that. Those things have too great a hold over our heart. We need the grace of God. We need the gospel truth to free us from that power that they have over our lives. That's because everything can be a danger, isn't it? Proverbs 21.6 says this, The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapour and a snare of death. You see how in that person's case, they were willing to tell lies in order to get this thing. So it, their heart was so gripped by this, the desire for this, that they were willing to do a wrong thing. And yet they didn't realise, as this passage says, this verse, that it's, a vapour, a snare of death, you wouldn't want to touch it. Everything can be given currency, and we know that, and reality is that wealth and money are just part of life. And we have to discover this gospel response then, developing a gospel heart to live as we ought. And that means to enjoy God's good, good gifts without losing God's favour. Proverbs 11.26 gives a real core truth here in this. It says, Whoever trusts in their riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Trusting, that's what we're talking about, going back to our hearts. Where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so, as we think about this, we have great gospel assurance that our Heavenly Father will look after his children. Those who look to him and trust him and those honouring the Lord with their wealth will never have any lack. Enough begins to satisfy our hearts rather than excess. And then we can affirm the truths of this little book of Proverbs, which says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure or trouble with it. Isn't that a theme right throughout the whole of Proverbs? Better is a little with the fear of the Lord. Enough. And so having developed, or better, continuing to, to develop a gospel heart towards material things means that they, we then are free from their powerful control so that when the Lord rules our heart, his peace reigns in our lives and then we're able to bless others with what he has given us. Following through, as it says in Proverbs 19.17, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. Or 28.27, Whoever gives to the poor will never be in want. It's so liberating to see how gospel hearts are able to enjoy the good gifts of God without becoming corrupted by them. They're able to work hard because hard work often produces good things. Proverbs 13.4 says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, whereas the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. There's so much more could be said about this. But just ponder it finally, how Jesus looks at material things. He's described as having nowhere to lay his head. Even on his death, the soldiers gambled for his final clothes. And yet his life was full and his soul was rich and his presence added infinite value to everyone and every place he went. He advises us not to lay up treasure on earth, but to lay up treasure in heaven. 
so that the prayer of Proverbs 30 is a good way to end. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say who is the Lord, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord.